Um, today we're going to do a bunch of things. We're going to do logistics beforehand, and then we'll do what I was hoping to do last time, the introduction to the Depression Economics Unit. Um, that so far we've been doing economic growth, and we've been worrying about capital accumulation and investment requirements and demographic burden and efficiency of labor and so forth. Um, throw all of that away now, or rather don't throw all of that away until you've finished your problem set and be ready to bring it back when it's time for the midterm or the final. But now we're going to be moving on to another branch of macroeconomics in which our economic models will have almost nothing at all to do with the model of GDP per worker in economic growth that we've been doing for two and a half weeks now. Um, we're going to assume for the next, oh, I don't know what, maybe four or five weeks that all of the growth economics things are put to one side that the economy has a trend growth rate and that trend growth rate is constant, but that what we are really interested in is the extent to which the economy falls below its trend level of economic potential. To what extent is the economy humming like a relatively smooth machine producing almost all the stuff that it is capable of sustainably producing, and to what extent um, to what extent is the economy falling well short of production with enormous waste in excess and high unemployment? And how do economies get themselves wedged into situations of extraordinary high unemployment like now and like we saw much worse in the Great Depression? And how do we get out of them? And for that, we need a different framework and a different set of intuitions than for the long-run growth part of the course that we've been talking about up until now. Um, but first, some logistics. Office hours. Um, today's the first time I'm going to be holding office hours after class um, in the, say, on the patio outside the Free Speech Movement Cafe. After class, give me a chance to fill up my coffee cup, um, and then I'll meet whoever wants to come on the patio afterwards to talk about whatever people want to talk about. Office hours Wednesday right now are shaky. I may get drafted to take part in various economics department recruitment activities as we try to hire additional professors. Uh, we being somewhat short of professors right now, which is one reason I'm up here in front of you teaching a course I don't usually teach. And then Friday afternoon, if there's sufficient demand, um, there's a possibility of holding yet more extra office hours. We'll see. Problem set three, you know, the growth economics review is due on Thursday, February 10th at the beginning of lecture, right smack here. And there's an error in the problem set. Um, when I relabeled question three to question one and question four to question two, I forgot to change the references in question two, what's now question two. So they refer to question one rather than question three. Um, so for question two, you're supposed to be assuming that all the parameters are the same as in question one, except for those that I change. Um, but if you want to assume that all the parameters in question three are the same and do the problem that way, um, I really can't object. And we are working toward an early March 1st midterm, um, either March 8th or March 10th, depending on how things go. And with that, let me, um, but for problem set three, um, I want you to nail this stuff uh, before we drop it and move on. So let me do one of the problems um, in problem set three, only I've changed a couple of the numbers a little bit. Um, so you can't simply take what I'm going to do and copy it down number for number. Um, you got to figure out what's changed. And the problem asks you to compare growth in South Korea and in the United States and to project them forward into the future um, using our growth model um, and using what have become our standard assumptions um, for growth in an advanced industrial country. Um, that the capital share diminishing returns parameter, alpha is 0.5 in our model, that the rate of improvement in the efficiency of labor in the United States is 2% per year, Note that the rate of improvement of the efficiency of labor in South Korea has averaged 5% per year 
since the economic reforms at the start of the 1960s under dictator Park Chung-hee, and assume that both South Korea and the United States today are on their balanced growth paths and are going to stay on them. And the point of this problem is to send you back to our magic canonical economic growth model equation, that output per worker on the left-hand side is equal to the efficiency of labor in an economy over here, times a term that is the steady state capital intensity of the economy. The capital output ratio, how much the capital stock in the country is worth, divided by the level of real GDP in the economy. And that capital intensity is, um, we showed, under sort of these oversimplified assumptions, equal to the savings investment effort being made by the economy the share of production that is being saved and invested in adding to the capital stock, divided by the savings requirements um, of the economy. Um, N, the labor force growth rate, because when the labor force growth rate is higher, that means that more of your investment has to go to equipping extra workers with capital and less is left over to deepen the capital stock at the disposal of any one worker. So an economy with a faster rate of labor force growth is going to be a less capital intensive economy. The depreciation rate, delta, and as capital wears out or becomes obsolete, you've got to replace that. And the third part of the investment requirements is you know, the labor efficiency growth rate. When labor efficiency is growing fast, you need to invest more or more of your investment has to go to equipping your workers with the capital they need in order to realize that labor efficiency growth rate. Take this capital intensity term, um, raise it to this alpha over one minus alpha power, um, which as I said in this particular problem is a nice parameter equal to one because alpha is one half. Multiply that by the efficiency of labor and you have the level of output per worker in an economy. And if you know how the efficiency of labor behaves over time, and if you know that the economy is on its balanced growth path so that this gives you its capital intensity, you can figure out how prosperous um, it's likely to be. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, part A, um, to your eye clickers. You know, what is the efficiency of labor in South Korea today um, in this particular model? We had our problem, we had South Korea had a GDP per worker level of 40,000. Um, it had a savings rate of 27.5%. Um, it's had a population growth rate of 1%, a depreciation rate on capital of 5%, and a rate of growth of the efficiency of labor of 5%. Those three things, um, together with your alpha parameter equal to one half, um, should allow you to then figure out what the efficiency of labor is in South Korea. Um, today. Let me repeat the numbers you're going to need. You're going to need the GDP per worker level of 40,000. Um, you're going to need the savings share of 27.5. You're going to need the 1, the 5, um, and then the 5% growth rate for the efficiency of labor. Um, and in order to do that, you're then going to need the magic growth equation. Um, so what do people think? Um, um, it should be, yep. At least the computer thinks it's gotten 77 by now. Um, yep. Um, As I say, these are hard to do live um, and under pressure. Uh, as I say, I only get them right two-thirds of the time. Um, here we're doing 53% um, as the right answer. Um, the right answer um, comes from the fact that our S over N plus G plus delta gives us a capital output ratio of two and a half so that the level of GDP per worker is then two and a half times the efficiency of labor. 
and that gives you an efficiency of labor for South Korea today of $16,000 per year. Um, that's what we're looking for. Um, now for part B, part B was the same question for the United States. Um, and if I can back up what we needed for the United States, um, here I said suppose that the United States has a GDP per worker level of 90,000, um, population growth rate of 1%, depreciation rate of 5%, savings investment share of 2%, um, and efficiency of labor growth rate of 2% per year. Um, what then is that going to lead you to conclude um, should be the rate of, or that should be the level of the efficiency of labor um, in the United States today? Same big growth theory, master growth theory equation. Analogous calculation, uh, but for a different country um, with different parameters. Okay. You see, and 36. Yep, um, that's right. Um, that's good. That's excellent. Once again, um, once again, you have a capital intensity of two and a half um, for the United States, only because it's richer, um, 90,000 bucks per year in output per worker rather than 40,000. That corresponds to an efficiency of labor of $36,000. Note, an interesting fact here is that even though South Korea is saving and investing a significantly greater share of its output than the United States is these days, Nevertheless, both economies are about equally capital intensive right now. Um, how can this be so? Well, South Korea has been growing wealthier very rapidly over the past generation. A whole bunch of the capital stock that we have and use in the United States today was made long ago. Um, look at the Golden Gate Bridge, for example. The Golden Gate Bridge was made in the late 1930s. This means that even though South Korea is investing a large share of current output, in its capital stock. A lot of its capital stock still comes from the days when South Korea was a lot poorer um, than it was now, and so wasn't rich enough to invest very much um, by our standards. It so happens that these two things balance out. Faster growth on the part of South Korea on the one hand um, balances out, it's in, reduces its capital intensity because a whole bunch of capital was invested, was made in the past when South Korea was poor or poorer than it is now, higher investment increases um, its capital intensity. These two things balance out and leave the economies about equally in capital intensive. And the United States is significantly richer um, because we still manage to deploy our labor and have a better trained labor force that is more productive, even though those living in Seoul have much better internet connections uh, than those living in Berkeley and significantly better um, cell phone reception as well. Um, what are these differences? Um, well, McKinsey Global Institute did a very large set of studies of international productivity differences um, across the world, um, which I recommend to you if you're interested in going into this in much more detail. Um, but the idea is, or the basic idea is that the United States still has a significant educational edge and also a significant organizational edge. People in the United States spend a lot less time standing around waiting for the cement mixer to show up um, so that the concrete can be poured than people in South Korea do um, even today. Um, and now let's go forward to the, um, the part C, um, where we shift from the magic master growth theory equation to simply doing compound growth. Output per worker in the United States is $90,000 per year right now. Um, what's it going to be in 2100? Um, what's it going to be? Well, it was 90 years uh, from when I first wrote down this problem. Um, you know. And again, approximate. We're looking for things to one or at most two significant figures. Um, what's likely to happen? Um, assuming nothing bad happens. Assuming we don't nuke ourselves or fry ourselves or global warm ourselves um, into poverty. Um, 
and see $500,000 per year, that's the answer, that's the right answer that I'm going to be looking for. Uh, where does that come from? Well, simply take the 90,000 that's current output per worker um, and multiply it by 1.02 to the 90th power. That gives you $535,000 per worker of current purchasing power GDP come the United States in 2100 if nothing goes wrong um, and if the pace of modern economic growth um, continues. At the moment, I don't see any reason why the pace of modern economic growth should not continue absent thermonuclear war, I don't know, a cyber virus plague, or great political upset caused by global warming. Um, and you should think about that, because that means that your great-grandchildren come 2100 uh, will be absolutely filthily rich uh, by our standards, in ways that we probably cannot fully comprehend. Um, you know, think back to what life, what the life of your great and great great grandparents was back in 1900, compare it to your life today. That seems to be the order of magnitude of difference that we're likely to look at if we don't blow it, if we manage to keep this machine of economic growth rolling. Um, Last question, uh, what will output per worker be in South Korea in 2100? Um, current level of output per worker at $40,000 per, um, work, $40, per worker per year. Um, current rate of economic growth, both the efficiency of labor and of GDP per worker at 5% per year. Um, what's this going to produce? Um, Okay, we're hitting the top. Um, okay, we got a good even spread um, out here of A, B, and C. Um, I tend to go for C, um, though I don't think there is a definite right or wrong answer here. Um, and let me tell you why. Um, well, the first thing you could do is say South Korea is on its steady state growth path. It's growing at 5% per year in terms of output per worker. It's at 40,000 bucks of output per worker now. Push that forward by 90 years and you get $3.2 million of current GDP in output per worker um, for the inhabitants of South Korea um, in 2100, um, provided the North Korean government doesn't go absolutely crazy and nuke Seoul at some time in the current lifetime uh, before that situation is resolved somehow. Um, and that situation really needs to be resolved somehow, right? That right now your average citizen of North Korea is four and a half inches shorter than your average citizen of South Korea. Um, and indeed, why it hasn't been resolved so far is I think largely the fault of the People's Republic of China which has not been playing a terribly helpful um, role in everyone's attempt to get reform in North Korea so that we no longer have a um, government that seems to have most of the defects of high Stalinist communism on the one hand, absolute hereditary monarchy on the other, and kind of theocratic god worship on the third. Um, it really does not seem to be going well. Um, and yet China has, for the past 60 years, thought that it had a security interest in keeping a, what it has tradition, used to characterize as a United States puppet, um, South Korea, from having a, govern, from having a border um, on Manchuria. Um, hopefully China's attitude will change relatively quickly and there can be some resolution um, of the Korean situation. Um, and if there is, and if Korea grows at 5% per year from now till 2100, um, it will be absolutely, filthily, amazingly rich come 2100. Um, but can South Korea's efficiency of labor continue to grow at 5% per year indefinitely? Um, I would say probably not, right? That South Korea's efficiency of labor is growing rapidly now because there's still a lot of skills to be learned and a lot of technology to be transferred from the North Atlantic Industrial Core over to South Korea. At some point, um, that's likely to slow down and stop. 
Um, and then South Korea's level of the efficiency of labor is likely to grow along with that of the rest of the industrial core of the world economy. Or so I would argue. Um, but even then, South Korea is a high savings country. It's likely to maintain its high savings rate even after its efficiency of labor growth rate slows. That would give it a higher capital labor ratio than the United States. And saying that output or the efficiency of labor in 2100 is the same as the efficiency of labor in the United States would then give you 735,000 bucks, which I think is probably the best answer. Yeah? Um, my clicker results. Let me see. A, B, C, and um, 500,000. Um, oh, and I did this wrong. I actually was supposed to put 735,000 up there, uh, and I didn't. Um, so I'd say none of these answers uh, are my preferred ones. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, um, at least I think that's supposed to be, I think that's supposed to be in the problem set. Um, um, all right, well then A is one half, um, and G is 5% and 2%, uh, respectively. Um, so that's what I want you to do, but some of the numbers are different. Um, uh, that's what I'm hoping you'll take out um, of this part of the course. And what I'm hoping will stick after the end of the course, um, that you'll be able to, at cocktail parties, opine intelligently about the relative wealth of different countries in the past and the future by saying, oh, you realize the high demographic burdens of its rapid population growth rate um, make it likely to be a relatively poor country. Yeah? Do you have a question? No? Okay. All right. So um, last piece of logistics. Um, time to start reading about the financial crisis. Um, time to start reading the auxiliary reading book of this. Um, all the devils are here. So you have something else to talk to in your already overstressed and overcrowded sections. Um, so for sections starting, say, Thursday after class, I want you all to have skimmed and be ready to talk about chapters 1 through 5 of MacLeod and... Um, McLeod and Nosera's, um, no, Bethany, McLean and Nosera's All the Devils Are Here on securitization, on how it was that people thought that taking a whole bunch of mortgages, um, mashing the rights to the money paid out for them into bonds, um, and then selling the whole thing together as bonds to investors, why people thought this made sense. Um, and then for sections starting a week from Thursday, we're going to be talking about chapters 6 through 8 on policy. Uh, for the end of February sections, you're going to be talking about chapters 9 through 15 on the development of the irrational exuberance that led to the big bubble um, in subprime mortgages in the mid-2000s. Then for the, week, for the sections between March 3rd and March 10th, um, you get to read about smart guys trying to figure out how to take advantage of the fact that prices of mortgages and of housing look too high, um, and why their attempts to make money by speculating against an overvalued market doesn't lead to the market correcting itself. That even though there are a lot of people out there who say, wait a minute, this market is too high, there's money to be made by going short, they're unable to put prices back to some normal level. Um, and then that sets up for the sections of the last week before spring break their narrative of the coming of the financial crisis um, itself. Um, that's going to take up any extra section time you have in discussion between now and spring break. And that stuff about the origins of the financial crisis, I'm really not going to be able to cover in lecture. What I'm going to be talking about during the depression economics um, part of this lecture series is the consequences of that financial crisis namely the freezing up of the financing mechanisms by which businesses find themselves able to borrow money to add to their capital stock on reasonable terms, um, the fall in investment spending resulting from that freezing up, and the consequences of that fall in investment spending for employment and production. Um, so that ends our logistics part um, of this lecture. Um, 
A few more brief words on recapitulations, um, on the concepts I hope that you have nailed. Um, no. um, hmm. Completely nailed, I hope. Yeah, you got this on how much bigger is total world GDP than it was 10,000 years ago. Um, oh, what's the unemployment rate? Yeah, the unemployment rate changed between last Thursday and today as at 5.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released the results of its second week of January current population survey of the United States. Um, of all the households who they found, of all the adults and all the households who they found when they knocked on doors, how many said that they were looking for work and hadn't find a job, um, divided by um, the total number employed plus the total number looking for work? Yes, OK. We got 43% right. Um, the seasonally adjusted unemployment rate reported for January 2010 is, or 2011 is 9.0%. Yeah? Hmm. That's bleak. How's that? <laughs> All right, that's better. Okay, we'll try um, to investigate. Um, we'll try to investigate why Microsoft is unable um, to put the same image, or why Microsoft PowerPoint's unable to put the same image on both screens. All right, thank you. Um, that's appreciated. Um, 9.0, um, good number. Um, one interesting thing to note um, about 9.0, that if you actually look at the survey results, um, count them all up, um, and ask what are people actually saying, 9.8% of those whom the Bureau of Labor Statistics classified as being in the labor force in 2000 and January 2011 were unemployed. Um, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics says the unemployment rate in January is 0.8 percentage points above normal, um, simply because of the step down from the Christmas selling season. Lots of jobs come to an end, and we expect an extra eight-tenths of the labor force be out of work in January as people who've been working on temporary jobs during the Christmas season um, start looking for other ones. Um, by contrast, um, if you looked back at December, back then 9.1% um, of those in the labor force were actually recorded as unemployed, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported the seasonally adjusted unemployment rate as 9.4% on the grounds that in December, because of the Christmas rush, um, the unemployment rate is usually three-tenths of a percentage point um, less than normal. So what actually happened to the current population survey between December and January was that the fraction of people in the labor, of the labor force unemployed in the United States rose from 9.1 um, to 9.8 percent, rose by seven-tenths um, of a percent. Um, but um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics had been expecting it to rise by 1.1 percent as people stepped down from the Christmas season to the post-Christmas doldrums. And so because the unemployment rate rose by only 0.7 percentage points, 0.4 percentage points less than they had been expecting from the seasonal movement, um, they reported that adjusting for the seasonal factor that the, Siri, that the, uh, the unemployment picture actually became quite a bit better, um, a significant fall uh, in the unemployment rate. Puzzling thing about that is that there's another survey, a survey of businesses, which counts how many people businesses have on their payrolls. And you know, the fall in the unemployment rate reported by households isn't matched by a rise in the employment number of workers employed um, reporting by businesses. And those two series should go together. Um, they don't always, and they don't always for reasons having to do with measurement error, with mistakes in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, ability to figure out how many firms there actually are, et cetera, et cetera. We're kind of watching this closely. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Um, you've got this, Say's Law. Um, why is it that the claim 
that there's always enough demand in the economy to employ everybody, that if there are some industries, say, making lattes in which there's excess, um, in which there's deficient demand, there'll be others like offering yoga lessons where there is excess demand and where businesses are frantically looking for people to work in them. Um, and the answer is that people want to spend their money not just on currently produced goods and services, but on financial assets. And when a huge number of people get into their heads that they want to accumulate more financial assets and spend less on currently produced goods and services, if the economy gets into trouble, um, you know the single equation you should most often to analyze economic growth. Um, let's skip that. We've already done a bunch of um, problems. And now we finally get on um, to depression economics, um, which once again starts from Say's law, or rather from the fact that Say's law fails. Back in 1803, when Jean-Baptiste Say got into this economics business, um, he said that it could not be the case that sales are dull owing to the scarcity of money. Um, and we would interpret scarcity of money today to be the same thing as excess demand for financial assets. Um, you know, um, instead, Jean-Baptiste Say said, if sales are low, um, it's because people aren't producing things efficiently. Um, and he said, should the increase of traffic of sales require more money to facilitate it, um, the want is easily supplied because merchants know well enough how to find substitutes for the product serving as the medium of exchange or money. Um, that is, if you want to buy something from somebody and if you don't have cash on hand, um, if for some reason the government hasn't printed enough dollar bills for you to have your share, um, well then whoever you're buying it from will usually be extremely anxious to extend you credit in normal times. Um, let's say you want to buy this car, um, okay as long as you're willing to enter into a consumer credit contract we'll lend you the money to buy the car. Um, we trust that you'll be good for it and besides we have repo men who can take the car back um, if you don't pay. This is a good business decision for us. And indeed we'd say most of the time, um, most of the time says correct. Uh, most of the time if there's a shortage of financial assets in the economy then private businesses will be eager to do something to create more financial assets. Um, that the auto company, the General Motors Assistance Corporation, will go out into the marketplace and tell the bank saying hey we need more money to make car loans. <laughs> And the banks will look around and they'll look at their customers and they'll tell their customers they have a once in a lifetime savings opportunity. Um, and so the savings will get diverted to the General Motors Assistance Corporation, which will issue certificates of indebtedness to the people who give it its savings, will issue its own bonds. And that money will then flow through into the auto companies and lo and behold, you'll have made the extra financial assets uh, that people need in order to carry out the transactions that they want. Not always. Um, it didn't happen in 1829. Right? In 1829 the Bank of England found that all of a sudden a lot of people were worried that the banknotes it had issued weren't very good. There had been an enormous boom in Britain over the previous nine years. Um, all kinds of people had been starting all kinds of canal companies and all kinds of textile companies and digging big holes in the ground throughout England with the idea that then people will float barges on them and will collect tariffs from barges and make a lot of money. People were worried that the canal sector had been overbuilt and maybe a whole bunch of these canals wouldn't produce any profits at all. And people said, hold it, we're not so sure about this bank, these Bank of England notes we've been holding in our vaults. We'd rather have gold. Um, so they took their bank notes and they went to the Bank of England and they said, we want gold coins or gold bars. We don't want these notes. We're not confident that you, Bank of England, are too big to fail. Um, that's what specie means in this context. Um, actual, real gold. Um, and so the Bank of England, finding that when people were bringing its banknotes in faster than it could print them and ask for, for gold and not having a great deal of excess gold in its vaults, um, simply stopped issuing banknotes, um, which meant that it stopped buying bonds from businesses 
in exchange for its banknotes, um, which meant um, which meant that a whole bunch of businesses uh, that had been expecting that they would be able to borrow cash from the Bank of England um, in exchange for giving the Bank of England title to their next week's sales or the weeks after that sales couldn't do so. Um, and as their own debts became due, they were forced to meet them because they couldn't do their normal borrowing. Um, and then you get a financial crisis um, and you get a depression. Um, selling goods for half of what they cost in an attempt to raise cash, um, multitude of workers without work, um, many bankruptcies declared. Um, that's what happened in 1829. Um, that's the story um, that we've been telling over and over again ever since, um, that there's a financial crisis. And so financiers and firms get scared <coughs> that the debts owed to them won't be repaid. <coughs> and get scared that the debts that they owe will not get rolled over. And so financiers and firms stop spending as much on currently produced goods and services as they try to build up their larger cash reserves to deal with the large numbers of people coming to them and demanding that they pay their debts in cash that they expect to have happen. And as they stop spending, inventories of unsold goods rise. All over the economy, a whole bunch of things that have been produced with the idea that people would spend to buy them pile up in extra inventories. And then as businesses see their inventories rise, businesses start firing people so that their inventories of unsold goods don't rise any higher. But the people who are then fired lose their jobs. And as they lose their jobs, they lose their incomes. And they then stop spending as well. This is a story of depression economics. Um, what are the cures? Um, well, there are potentially three cures. The first is that if the private sector won't spend, you can have the government buy stuff directly. Um, that after all, the government is too big to fail, or at least is supposed to be too big to fail. And even if there's not enough demand for currently produced goods and services elsewhere in the economy, the government can step in. Of course, recently we found out that the governments of Iceland, Greece, and Ireland are definitely not too big to fail. And they can't buy because no one trusts their promises. The rest governments, though, are still OK. Um, you can have the government flood the zone with cash. This is what the Bank of England actually did during the financial crisis of 1825 and 1826, with the idea that if the central bank, if the government simply floods the economy with cash, Nobody is scared they won't have enough cash to pay off their debts. Um, instead, people will say, hey, look, we have all this cash. We should spend it on something useful. It's not doing us any good sitting here in our vaults. We could do much better um, with it if we bought something useful with it. Um, that's number two. Number three is to get the confidence fairy um, to show up, uh, to get businesses eager to spend their cash yet again. Um, and it's something that governments always try to do in a financial crisis and a downturn. Um, we saw President Obama do it yesterday when he went to the Chamber of Commerce and asked the businessmen of America to take some of the cash they had been hoarding and spend it on buying stuff. It's pretty humiliating. Um, most humiliating came during the Great Depression when Herbert Hoover was wandering around asking businesses to spend, saying, if you spend, then prosperity will be just around the corner. Um, these are all three things that you can do um, to deal with a depression. We're going to try to ascertain how effective each of them is likely to be, as well as calculate how large um, a depression is likely to be. And so we're going to build an economic model, a very different model, as I said before, than the solo growth model we have been using. Um, so stop thinking about the solo growth model except for limited times when you have to do economic growth over the next several weeks while we do depression economics, while we build up what's called the Keynesian income expenditure model. Um, and it's a very simple, um, a very simple model. Um, it says that there are just four sets of main actors in the economy. There are importers and exporters on the one hand. There's a government that buys stuff on the second hand. On the third hand, there are businesses that want to buy, build new factories. And last, there are households 
um, busy buying consumption goods. And all four of these flows of spending come from different places, and all four of them add up to total aggregate demand for currently produced goods and services. And in order to understand when and why you're in a situation of high unemployment, you need to be able to calculate aggregate demand in the economy and compare it to the economy's productive capacity. And we're going to do more than simply draw stick figures and arrows. We're going to do some algebra um, for this model. Um, and in order to do the algebra, you need to know one thing. And that thing is that the letter Y in this model stands for lots of things. That the letter Y stands for the economy-wide incomes um, received by households. It stands for the level of production um, by firms. It stands for the level of spending by households and businesses and importers and exporters and by the government. And it stands for all of them. Um, and it stands for all of them by the circular flow principle. Um, by which everyone's production, everyone's spending is sold by, is used to buy someone's production, and every act of production is then used to pay for, to pay somebody, to, um, is then a cause for businesses to pay somebody's income, and every dollar of income is then going to be spent um, by some final demander, right, on something. Um, and so we have consumption spending by households, investment spending by businesses, government purchases, and then our net exports equal to gross exports, that is total exports, minus imports. Um, those are the one, two, three, four, six, seven, seven, I guess, quantities that we're going to be want to keep control of and keep track of. Um, and we're going to start with the observation that consumption spending plus investment spending plus government purchases plus net exports those add up um, to total aggregate demand. Those add up to spending, to production, to incomes. Um, and we'll usually want to write not exports, not net exports, but rather gross exports minus imports for the, that portion of aggregate demand. Um, and then we're going to want to set down some rules for what determines um, these particular um, flows. Most of the time, we'll just say that gross exports are kind of out there, um, that that's how much foreigners want to buy of things produced in the United States. And that will depend on the level of the exchange rate and the level of demand in foreign countries and on how good are the products we're making and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, but generally, for much of the time, it's simply going to be something that's determined outside the country. Um, or at least outside the country plus and in the foreign exchange markets, and that what happens inside this country doesn't have big feedbacks um, on it. Similarly, the government buys what it buys for it because of the way its political processes work out. There is no big immediate feedback from what else is going on in the economy to government purchases. Um, and business investment spending, well, that depends on what goes on in financial markets and on how optimistic businesses are. But once again, there's not a great deal of feedback um, from the level of GDP on the one hand to business investment spending on the other. Uh, there's a little bit of feedback. Um, if we were using my teacher Olivier Blanchard's textbook rather than um, mine and Marty Olney's, he'd talk a bunch um, about the feedback there is. Here I'm just going to assume it's zero simply to make things simpler. There is feedback in two important places. The first is in consumption spending. Um, when households' incomes fall, they're going to stop spending as much on buying stuff. They're going to slow down their consumption spending on currently produced goods and services. Um, and so we say that each dollar by which incomes change are going to change consumption spending by some amount less than a dollar. Call it this particular parameter, C sub y. Um, C, lowercase c, because it's in the consumption equation. Lowercase y, because it tells us what the influence of incomes y is on consumption spending C. And then in front of that term, we put a little C0, a consumer confidence term um, that tells us what consumer confidence um, is going to be as a, as a function of you know, what consumer confidence is going to be and its impact 
on consumption spending. And actually, let me change that. For this course, um, mm -hmm. let's see if we can pull out. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to want to write this differently. Um, I'm going to write, want to write this as y minus t, um, where t are the taxes that the government collects, um, the federal government in this case, which is then going to be equal to c0 um, cy times 1 minus t uh, times y. Um, with the idea that the government collects, has a kind of stable and simple tax rate, tax system, and collects simply a fraction t, lowercase t of all income, and collects that in taxes. So in order to figure out what consumption spending is going to be, um, you have to take the total level of income in the economy, y, you have to multiply it by 1 minus t to get the total disposable income of households, how much income households get that then is not taxed away. Then you have to multiply it by this CY, by this marginal propensity to consume um, factor, and then add to it this baseline consumer confidence C0. That's going to give us consumption spending. That's going to give us a formula for consumption spending that depends on consumer confidence, on the tax rate, on how much leeway consumers have in their spending. Um, how much they feel they have to cut back on their consumption spending when incomes fall, and on the total level of income um, in the economy. And it's a very simple equation, but it's an equation that allows us to keep track of a bunch of things um, that influence consumption spending. A bunch of things that matter. If you read the daily news, daily financial news, you'll find a lot of attention is devoted, say, to surveys of consumer confidence. Um, devoted to that because people think that tells you something about what this parameter is. And if you're investing or planning a business, you really would like to have as much input, as, as, much, a, a, as much of a clue as you can um, to what's happening to consumer confidence because it affects consumption spending. Um, we're also going to say that imports, um, that imports are a constant fraction of incomes that the share of our total spending we spend on imported goods goes up and down when income um, goes up and down as well. Um, and note once again that these y's are standing for two different things. The two y's down here are incomes, the incomes of households. The y up here is spending and production. They're the same thing by the circular flow principle. Um, if they're not the same thing, they're going to be the same thing very quickly. Um, the fact that everyone's spending is someone's production becomes someone's income guarantees it. And the fact that income is the same as spending and as production is what allows even a small effect, a small change in investment to have potentially a bigger effect on the level of total production um, in the economy. And so then we want to go for a little bit more algebra, um, say. We start with our equation for the level of spending. Um, we notice that we have an equation for consumption spending and we have an equation for imports. And we can substitute these two equations in. This one in here for where consumption spending is. This one in here for imports. And then we have an equation which has a bunch of y's in it. Um, since we're going to want to solve for y, um, since we're going to want to figure out what aggregate demand is in this economy. Um, we're then going to want to move all the terms with y's in them to the left-hand side, which we can do. And we're then going to want to divide by the coefficient in front of y in this equation to get this particular equation here, um, which is our counterpart for depression economics of our magic central growth equation. Um, practically everything you'd problem you do will want you to use this equation at some point in time. Um, what, it, what does it say? 
Well, it says the level of expenditure, of aggregate demand, of output, of spending, of incomes in the economy. Why? Um, that's going to be equal to the quotient of two things. The first is this numerator. Um, I call it autonomous spending. Sometimes I think I'll use the letter A for it. Um, it's that part of spending that really doesn't change very much when income and production changes. It depends on the baseline level of consumption spending, which depends on how confident, con confident consumers are. It depends on business investment spending, which depends on what's going on in financial markets and how exuberant businessmen are. It depends on government purchases, which are produced by the political system. It depends on gross exports, which are determined by foreigners' taste for domestically made goods. You take those four things and you add them up together, um, and then you divide them. Um, you then divide them by one minus, and here we have one minus the tax rate. Here we have the marginal propensity to consume. Here we have the marginal propensity to import. This gives us an equation for how to calculate why. Um, how to calculate the level of demand in an economy. Um, where does this equation come from? Um, well, it comes from the fact that we have our four components um, of aggregate demand, consumption, investment, government purchases, and net exports, um, but that a bunch of those components of aggregate demand also depend on the level of income. Um, let's suppose consumption spending rises. And you'd think that would lead production, spending, production, and incomes to rise. But as spending, production, and incomes rise, um, well, households feel more flush. They have more cash on hand. Um, and so they increase their consumption spending even more. Um, how much do they increase their consumption spending? Well, in the first round, they increase it by 1 minus t, by the change in their disposable income, times their marginal propensity to consume that extra increase in consumption spending coming from not just from the initial increase in consumer confidence, but from the fact that households now have more money flowing into their pockets. Um, that's what produces this term here in the denominator. And this term here, this IMY term, um, this, comes from the fact, um, this comes from the fact that a whole bunch of demand is going to leak out to other countries that households are going to spend more, yes, but a bunch of that spending will be on imports. And so that spending will go to create demand for production and for labor and for incomes in Europe, um, in Mexico, in Brazil, in China, um, not so much here. Um, now normally, um, in a normal year, back before we had this big downturn, um, if this were back in 2007, um, I would say that investment in the United States economy was going along at $2 trillion per year. That government purchases were $2.5 trillion. That gross exports were $1.7 trillion. That the marginal propensity to consume, this CY term in our consumption function was 0.5. That our marginal propensity to import was 0.15. And that our federal tax rate, which is what matters here at the margin, is 0.2 and that our consumer confidence related term was 3.9 trillion a year. Think of that as how much households would want to spend even if they had no incomes at all. It won't be the case that households ever have no incomes at all, but if there were, that's kind of what they'd like to spend. Knowing that, what's Y going to be? Um, well, if you have all these parameter values, you can then calculate the denominator. Um, you got a one at the start, you got a one Oops, that's wrong. That needs to be minus 0.02, not minus 0.08. Um, 1 minus 0.02 times 0.5 um, plus 0.15 equals 0.75 uh, for the denominator. Um, our numerator is 2 plus 2.5 plus 1.7 plus 3.9 equals 2.1, um, equals 10.1. And so we have 10.1 divided by 0.75. Dividing something by 0.75 is the same thing as multiplying it by 1.33. Um, that's why this is called the multiplier um, model. Um, derived, or devised as it was by Richard Kahn in Cambridge, England back in the early 1930s. Um, 
10.1 times 1.33 gives you 13.5 trillion. That's dead on for what GDP was in the United States, for what output spending and production, production and incomes were for the United States back in the spring of 2008. Um, 13.5 trillion. That's what this model's good for. Um, so in our, um, hmm. In our little Keynesian model, um, what is our C um, going to stand for? Um, yep, um, consumption, that's good. Uh, we don't get anyone saying capital, and this is the reason we used K for capital rather than C back in the growth theory part. We didn't want confusion. Um, it doesn't stand for credit. We don't usually have a good letter um, for credit um, in this model. Um, C stands for consumption. It's by far the biggest piece um, of GDP. What does Y stand for? All right, we get a fairly even division. Um, and that's good because Y stands for all of the above. Right? Uh, it plays multiple duty by the circular flow principle um, in this particular model. It stands for economy-wide incomes. It also stands for economy-wide expenditure or total economy-wide spending. And it also stands for total economy-wide production. Um, it stands for aggregate demand, um, the total flow of spending, which is the same thing as B. And it also, in this model, stands for aggregate supply, uh, because businesses aren't going to produce more goods than there is demand for. Businesses don't want to see um, inventories piling up unsold on the shelves of retailers any more than anyone else does. Um, so all of these five right, are correct. Sometimes people try to make a distinction between them to use E for expenditure and Y for income and Q for production. The fact the book that I learned this stuff from, um, Robert Gordon's Intermediate Macroeconomics textbook back in the 1970s, um, did indeed use E and Q and Y. Um, and that led to substantial confusion because the first step after writing down an equation in which E appeared on one side and Q on the other was to say, oh, by the way, these two are going to be the same thing. Um, I prefer you to use Y for everything and to put up front that we're looking for a model in which um, we can say that production is the same thing as, out, as kind of spending is the same thing as incomes. Um, some more computations, right? Um, Suppose we do 2, 2.5, and, and 1.7, um, and 3.9. Um, and let's see, did I actually change the numbers on this one? Um, 2, 2.5, 1.7, 3.9. Oh dear. Um, I am, ah, we have I am equals 0.15 now, not 0.2. A lower propensity to import. Um, What's Y then, or, mm, nope, I didn't change any of the numbers at all. That's bad, this should be 0.25, say. Um, what's Y gonna be? Um, mm, and let me boost that a 0.25, just to make it a little bit more interesting. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was supposed to have changed this. Um, okay. Five. Okay. All right. And again, we're spread out, which is as expected. And this time, when we calculate the denominator, um, we're going to get one 
minus 0.8 times 0.5, which is 0.4. So we have 1 minus 0.4 is 0.6, uh, plus IMY, which is 0.85. Um, so we're going to be dividing 1 by 0.85. Um, which is going to give us something a little bit less um, than six-fifths, um, and a little bit less than six-fifths times 10.1. That's going to produce something closer to 12.8 um, than it is to our earlier answer of 13.5. Um, and in fact, um, yeah. Um, Okay, but good job. Um, you haven't seen these before, and these are once again hard to do on the fly. Um, they are the calculations that we're going to want you to do um, in trying to analyze depressions like the one we're currently in. Yeah? Uh, is this household, uh, savings sort of household savings aren't in this version of the model. They're kind of hidden in the background. And I'll get to that either at the end of this lecture or the start of the next one, um, where household savings go. Um, but, you know, um, so now the income expenditure model, if we try to say it in words, right? There's income on the one hand, um, and there's production and spending on the other. Um, if you ever have a situation in which spending is less than income and people are trying to build up their stocks of financial assets, and businesses will see their inventories rising and they'll fire workers. Those workers will lose incomes. Um, and then as they lose incomes, they're going to cut back on their spending as well because when consumers have less income, they're kind of scared about spending it all. And the process then repeats. And the process repeats until incomes have fallen sufficiently low that spending is no longer um, less than income. And there the economy tends to sit. Um, to calculate that point to which income, spending, and production Y all fall, you take the four components of autonomous spending A, those four components of demand that don't depend on the level of income, um, and then you use the tax rate T, the marginal propensity to consume, and the marginal propensity to import to calculate how the rest of the parts of spending react to changes in income. And together, these allow us to calculate a whole bunch of things. Um, so if we have a downturn, um, if we have spending less than income as people are trying to build up their financial assets, why don't income and production then drop all the way back to zero? Um, why do we get a stable spot? Why does our equation have a solution? rather than saying that as incomes fall, um, as incomes fall, spending falls, and then that causes incomes to fall some more because more things get fired, more workers get fired, and they lose their incomes, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a question that our own professor George Akerlof um, kind of worried about when he was a child. Um, the answer he came up with, um, the answer he tended to come up with, puts it with, is B. Um, all are correct, right? All are different ways, views of looking at the same process, right? That when spending has, is no longer below incomes, then inventories aren't rising um, anymore. Um, whenever the marginal propensity to consume is less than one, then when incomes fall, Sooner or later, people will forget about their desire to build up their holdings of financial assets if they become poor enough, and the economy will settle at a short-term equilibrium. And it is indeed the case that when incomes fall low enough and people feel poor enough, they do forget about their desire to build up extra holdings um, of financial assets. All three of those are fine. Um, we did the magic equation for depression economics before. Um, let's try to apply this to what happened in the year between the second quarter of 2008, the spring of 2008, and the spring of 2009, um, which was an extremely depressing part point to live through, um, as something we thought that we had figured out how to avoid and prevent um, suddenly happened. Um, start with our equation. Um, Aggregate demand and spending and output and incomes Y is equal to these four components of autonomous spending, 
consumptions from baseline consumption, investment, government purchases, and gross exports on the top, um, divided by these multiplier terms. Um, one minus the dependence of consumption spending on income plus the dependence of import spending um, on income. And let's just think about what happened um, between the spring of 2008 and the spring of 2009. Let's look at the changes um, in real GDP. Um, and to denote that we're looking at changes, let's put a big Greek capital delta um, in front of the Y, um, simply to indicate that we're looking at a change. Um, well, we have no special reason to think that anything special was going to happen to consumer confidence in the spring of 2008. Um, and no special reason to think that anything was going to happen to government purchases um, in the spring of 2008. Uh, but between the spring of 2008 and the spring of 2009, um, the subprime financial crisis came to its head and all of a sudden it became clear that the big banks of the United States and of the world that they hadn't taken their investments in subprime mortgages and sold them off to other people, to other investors as they were supposed to, but instead that they had kept a huge amount of risk on their own books and they now had assets that its value was very low, um, that the decline in the value of their assets was much greater than their net worth and that every big bank in the United States and in Europe was potentially bankrupt um, unless something was done right now. Um, which meant that banks weren't willing to lend to businesses on any terms whatsoever. And so because businesses couldn't borrow to finance their investment spending, that pushed business investment spending down by $630 billion between spring of 2008 and spring of 2009. And because a bunch of our exports go to finance investment in other countries, that pushed our exports down by $270 billion because this was a global um, recession. We can feed in our parameters in the denominator um, and get roughly 0.8. We can add up the two big shocks in the numerator, the shock to investment spending and the shock to exports, and get minus 900. Um, divide minus 900 by 0.8. And you say that in a year starting in the spring of 2008, if you were to have these two big shocks to investment spending and to exports, we'd expect real GDP in the United States to fall by $1.125 trillion. Um, actually, it fell by only $840 billion. Um, we did somewhat better because consumption spending held up more strongly than we had thought, and imports, um, and imports actually fell more than we thought they were likely to. But this rough order of magnitude agreement um, was enough to make us economists feel happy saying, wow, this simple model that we teach in Econ 100B and in IAS 107, this actually applies to the real world. Um, it's not the case that we live in, I don't know what, some kind of full employment world in which investment spending falls, consumption spending rises to pick up the slack. Um, instead, the fall in output was bigger um, than the fall in investment spending. Hmm. And we can look at it in more, more detail um, at the levels of each of the pieces of GDP. Um, and if you notice anything from this, it's that consumption spending held up remarkably well um, throughout the first year of the big crisis. Uh, that in spite of the fact that the unemployment rate was rising from 5% to 9% and beyond, and consumers' incomes were falling, they really didn't cut back on their consumption spending a lot, um, although they did cut back on import spending a lot. There was a bunch of switching of spending from imports to domestically produced goods, um, which still has us somewhat puzzled, and people are writing papers about that right now. Um, if we want to do the changes, um, the first column has what happened starting the year of 2000 and the spring of 2008. The second column tells you what normally happens over the year. The third quarter gives the important um, numbers, the numbers relative to the overall growth trend of the American economy. Um, that's just a detail of what I showed you before, um, that the predictions of our extremely simple model were in fact roughly correct as explaining what was happening to the American economy in 2008-2009. 
And then there's the question of what we should have done about it. Um, I'm going to suppose that you're our Christy Romer, pulled out of Berkeley and moved to Washington on very short notice and told to advise Barack Obama on what he should do given that investment spending and gross exports are collapsing. Um, what's the right policy uh, for the US government to follow um, in this particular case? All right, um, and people say E. Uh, people say try to do everything. Uh, do expansionary fiscal policy, boost government purchases, try to boost the value of G of government purchases in our equation, hoping that that increase will boost spending um, and demand and employment. Um, so, but also try to talk down the value of the dollar um, so that American-made goods are more attracted to foreigners and so boost exports. Um, and also provide government guarantees to banks and businesses to increase business confidence that they won't lose their money if they invest um, so that I will rise as well. And I think that's by and large right. Um, I think that's by and large right that when you face a large demand gap like we did, to kind of try to do everything is a reasonable strategy because you don't know what's going to be truly effective and you also don't know what you're going to be able to implement easily. Um, and I think all the other answers are somewhat less good. Um, raise government purchases by $840 billion a year to fill in the demand gap. Um, actually, we only raised government purchases by about $300 billion per year at the federal level. And we then found most of that offset as state and local governments cut back on their spending. Um, but if we did raise government purchases by $840 billion a year, then you'd raise incomes, but higher incomes would put more people to work and they'd spend more, and so we'd find aggregate demand had actually risen by more than $840 billion. And so we'd probably be in a situation, like we'll consider three weeks from now, of inflation. Um, where the demand for the economy's current production outstrips what factories can reasonably produce. And while that's not as serious an economic problem as the downturn we're in right now, that is a serious economic problem. Um, you don't want to solve your deflationary spiral by creating an inflationary spiral. Um, D, um, given our value of the multiplier, D would have been a reasonable thing to do if that was the only thing um, that you were doing. Uh, but why should that be the only thing you were doing? Better to do a little bit less of government purchases and more of Treasury and Federal Reserve policy. Um, a and B. Um, B I don't like um, because B, if it's true at all, it's true in the long run. It's not true in the short run of three months or a year or two years or even five years. Um, to think that if you cut back on government spending, this will automatically improve consumer conf or business confidence and businesses will invest more is, I think, naive and unlikely to be true. Right? Um, it is the case that if businesses fear very high taxes in the future, they're unlikely to invest. Uh, but if businesses fear that unemployment will be high in the future, they're also unlikely to invest. It's not something you can rely on, although the British government right now is trying to rely on it in a set of policy moves that I at least regard as extremely risky and dangerous. Um, and A, um, A seems to me to be completely wrong. Um, that the problem in a depression is that demand for the stuff the economy can produce is too low. Um, and so since the private sector has sat down and it's not spending, somebody else needs to. And the government is a good candidate for someone who should stand up and spend more when the private sector spends less. Uh, nevertheless, A keeps showing up as a line, as an applause line in Barack Obama's speeches, and that genuinely worries me. So let me stop there, and I'll conclude what I'd hope to be the end of this lecture on Thursday and go on to the interaction of financial markets and aggregate demand. <laughs>